Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of uh, Duck Stories episode three, which is uh, the do's and don'ts of startup fundraising. I am really excited about today's episode, specifically because I have two amazing ladies, a dynamic duo in our ecosystem. And of course, we'll be getting to know more about uh, them, their failures, their learnings, and how they've helped startups in our ecosystem raise uh, and raise funds. So welcome Kalsum Lakhani and Mizwa Nakwi. Uh, both of them are co-founders and general partners at IDOI Ventures. It's great to have you guys here. Thanks for having us. Hi. Assalamualaikum, everybody. It's great to be here. Assalamualaikum, everyone. Thank you. So I'm just going to start by giving just a brief context to our audience here. Um, in 2021, this year alone, uh, our startups have received around $250 million in venture capital funding so far. And this is outspacing the $66 uh, million that they raised in 2020. Now, as an ecosystem, as is, uh, I'm sure in the audience, we have startups, students all from different uh, walks of life. Uh, you may know that as a startup ecosystem, we have come a long way um, and we've been growing in numbers in terms of new startups coming in, a blooming culture of entrepreneurship, along with an increasing number of uh, entrepreneurship support organizations. However, uh, despite all of the support network that startups have, they still, startup founders often still struggle with raising funds at the right time to keep their business afloat. Um, raising money and raising it quick becomes uh, one of the key challenges in the eventual success of any startup. Um, there are several factors to this, obviously, that one needs to consider. One is how quickly do you need to raise money? When should you raise it? Who should you raise it from? Uh, what type of funds do you need to raise depending on the nature of this business? So to answer all of these questions today, we have these lovely ladies, and I'm really excited to have uh, Kasum and Mesba join us for Duck Stories episode three. Um, today's discussion will be formed around recounting failure stories from past and professional experiences of raising funds for startups in the early stages. Um, we will also get to hear their, the dyna dynamic duo's experiences working with associations, large organizations, and obviously their own common initiative as well. Um, so let's start with Kalsum. Kalsum, I'd like uh, the audience to get an understanding of how far we have come as an ecosystem in Pakistan. I remember back in 2012, 2015, uh, there were just a few investors, companies in the space supporting startups. And now we have come to a point where startups in our ecosystem are raising Series B from international investors. So you founded I2I in 2011, I believe, and it's been 10 years to that journey. So I'd love to hear your perspective on how far we have come in terms of the investment landscape in Pakistan since then. Sure. So, I mean, I think what's really interesting is that, um, I mean, someone used the term like a flywheel effect of what's been happening in the, in the startup space, right? And, and actually in terms of the amount of companies that they've raised, as you mentioned, Sonia, I mean, companies are going probably, I think our prediction is they're probably going to surpass $300 million in funding this year, inshallah, right? Which, I mean, already where we are and we're only, you know, still at the end of August, we've already, if we combine 2019 and 2020, um, that's, we've doubled that, right. In terms of what we've been able to achieve so far just this year. So if we were to look back at the last 10 years in Pakistan, um, when, you know, I started working in the startup ecosystem, I mean, there was barely anything happening back then, right. So Pakistan, even macro wise, it was slow to start. Uh, but what started to happen, I think there was a number of different things that started to happen. So first of all, obviously from the support side, a lot of incubators, accelerators coming up. I obviously know that you're with NIC. So the fact that the government was promoting, these public private incubators that were happening as well. So we started to see more of a volume increase generally in the support space. Uh, I think we have over 80 co-working spaces in Pakistan right now. And, and our research team is actually working on our next iteration of the ecosystem studies. So we'll have better numbers on that. But then also what we started to see was that most of the deals that were happening in the startup space, 2015, there was a bit of an outlier year, but 2016 onwards was mostly pre-seed and seed deals, right? And a lot of companies that were raising were raising from local investors. And a lot of the local investors were doing more, I guess, vulture capital than venture capital in terms of 
taking too much equity in companies. So they weren't really setting them up for that kind of value chain of what needs to happen in a company's life cycle of raising later stages of investment. And so as the as more VC funds were coming into the market, both local and then externally, I think as the macro indicators in Pakistan started shifting, more and more international funds started to see the, um, the opportunity in Pakistan. And as more, out, as more external funds started to come into the market, not only did we see that money and that influx of capital coming in, but we also saw it professionalize even the local ecosystem. I can say that from Espana, even as local funds, we've had to up our game, right? Because of international VCs that are coming in, like they move really fast. Um, the types of terms that we see, all of that. And so I think as that professionalization is happening, ha as we're seeing those macro indicators like people are excited about, we're starting to see people graduate more from pre-seed to seed and moving into series A and B deals, obviously you were just mentioning. So when we can talk about the deals itself, like, I mean, you know, the fact that um, alone Airlift did 85 million, right? Alone Bazaar did 30 million. Those numbers were unheard of before, but it also speaks to just generally the average round size increasing. Um, obviously from a talent perspective, a lot of really amazing, you know, people from X Cream, X Rocket are launching companies as well. But we're starting to see more and more people graduate to larger found, uh, rounds of funding as well. So that's also what's kind of part and indicative of what why we're seeing the numbers increase overall. Um, was that a good 101? I'm yeah, trying to like pack in 10 years into one, like a quick snapshot for you. It was, and I, and I actually, I feel over the years, I also feel like the appetite increase as well, the investment appetite for, for yeah. not just local, but international investors as well. Um, Mizza, so I just, one question for you is founders uh, often find it hard to raise capital, uh, keeping their newly launched business afloat. What financial advice would you give to startups to keep the money side of things under control where, before it gets like way out of proportion? Sure. Um, so look, I think, uh, look, usually what we say is what we advice we give to founders is to get started and, and just bootstrap and just get started with something, do something small to test the market. Um, I also recognize that that sometimes is a privilege for people. And sometimes there is there are there's funding requirements that, you know, the business, the type of business they may be in, they can't just put something out there if there's a product based business, but the service is a little easier if you're involved in produce in providing a service to actually just get started and test the market. But obviously I recognize that with products, it's a little harder because you have to first create the product and then put it out there. But I really do think that as much as you can have family and friends, if you have those networks, if you have previous professional contacts or people in your circle who can help you and take a bet on you at such an early stage, they're not really investing in the business, they're investing in you. So they ha you have to see you have to be able to convince them that you have an idea and that that idea is worth pursuing. And I think before you actually go out and raise formal funding, I really always suggest that founders kick the tires on the business model. They figure out a little bit, is there a demand for what they're selling or not? Uh, that could be through surveys that they do. It could be through, you know, uh, if it's like I said, if it's a service, you can actually go out and provide the service and then see what kind of feedback that you get. Before you get into commitments, uh, formally outside of the company, outside of yourself uh, by raising money. So I would say if you don't have to raise money right away, don't do it. Try and see if you can get some help from family and friends, some help from peers or other people in your network, or maybe you have a, a product or a service which doesn't require any funds and that's even better because you can actually do some research uh, and get started and then maybe you know have a few people try it out. Um, I think once you start having some traction, um, that's the right time to start thinking about what it takes to make the business grow. Again, depending on the business model, you might find that with a little bit of money, you can actually go far. And within your circle of people that you know, your, 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 you know, your peers or others that you can actually test out a product. So I would say delay raising that money till you can. Can, but obviously, at the at the time that it the the business needs money to be able to grow, so that you can actually show people that you have something there. I think that's the time that you should think about when, what, how much you should raise, uh, and what kind of money you should be raising then. And of course, there's there's more there because the types of money would change depending on where you're at. Yeah, and I and I also think there are many organizations or many programs that also help such. Uh, I mean, we'll we'll go into that later, and we'll talk about how people can actually get more support from programs uh, when they're raising funds or raising investment as well. Um, Kalsum, I'd like to ask you, if, can you share, I mean, I'm sure you've worked with many startups over the years and uh, you have different stories. 
to share, but can you share an example of a startup in your opinion who faced a certain challenges while raising funds and what were those challenges? You don't necessarily have to name them, but just would like to know their experiences. Yeah, I mean, I alluded to it a little before. I mean, some one of the most common things that I saw happen, you know, pre, I feel like we're almost dealing with two generations or multi-generations of companies right now. So there's almost like the post-2019 companies and the choices that they, you know, have right now versus people that were pre-2019 and what was going on in this scarcity landscape of like a lack of funding. So I think one of the things that I would see of just like challenges overall were just like people just getting really onerous term sheets, right? Of, of investors that wanted to take, um, you know, 40, 50, 70% of companies coding it that they were like taking the risk on you. That's why they deserved the equity, but ultimately not setting you up from a perspective of like long-term, not setting you up to be able to raise future rounds of funding, right? And so we would see that happen all the time. Um, I would see it happen with even founders that I wasn't even officially working with. I just have people reach out to me on LinkedIn or WhatsApp being like, you know, ma'am, I don't know you, but could you like look at this term sheet for me? And I just think that that was kind of a, a, across the board, something that I saw happen was that people because, and because there wasn't much options on the table, people would take bad deals, right? Like, I mean, that was what we had in front of us. And so I think that's the thing. It's like not looking for, not realizing that, you know, they, they deserved better. Um, because they didn't know where else to look, right? And so I think that was also the case. I think that we've seen definitely investors that in deals in the past of companies that we've seen fold of other investors that came into deals of not wanting to get diluted. So blocking companies from raising their future rounds of funding. Um, that was definitely an issue. I think an issue that also happened in the pre-2019 world was, um, or just 2019 world as well, was like companies that didn't raise enough, right? Because they just didn't realize that they could raise more. And I think right now what we're seeing is like average round size increased to, you know, a million dollars. It's like, it's insane if I had talked to companies about that before. Right. And so I think when you don't raise as much as you can need, I think then you're kind of limited in terms of the amount of traction you can show and how that gets you to the next round of funding. And so I think all of those things were things that, um, you know, it's not one company that faced that, but I saw that amongst like hundreds of companies, um, that probably faced that in the box on ecosystem over the last 10 years. Sorry, I was on mute. And do you think it's getting better though? I mean, especially with the way you've, you're saying investors have been, uh, you know, I mean, different term sheets, different ways uh, investors taking advantage. Do you think that's changing now? Yes and no. Like, I think that, you know, it is changing, um, but it's changing for certain kinds of companies. Um, I think when we look at even the numbers, like, um, you know, when we look at where capital is going, you know, it's still 3% of the funding is, is going towards women-led companies, women-founded yeah. or founded companies, right? There's still a gender gap when it comes to financing. Um, when it comes to where capital is going, it's mostly going to sectors that we've seen um, it modeled in other emerging markets, right? So where international investors are coming in, we're seeing them come into deals where they might have seen, there's a mimicry effect, right? They're seeing that happen in another emerging market. They've been an investor in the same model in Indonesia, as an example, or in Egypt. So they are much more likely that reduces the risk for them to come in in the box on market. So while, you know, obviously then there's that photocopy effect of then people just building models where they see elsewhere, um, it's more difficult in spaces where, you know, you might be building something for the first time, or we haven't really seen a comparable in another market, or um, it's not in a space that's considered high growth. And so even if we look at the numbers right now with for Pakistan, overwhelmingly, the amount of money is going towards e-commerce. Quantum of deal wise, we're seeing about the same amounts of deals that are coming up in e-commerce and fintech. And then ed tech is right after that, health tech right after that, all of that, but very like for like far thirds and fourths of what's happening. And so I think that, you know, that to me is, speaks to the fact that yes, there is a lot of money coming in. If you, I mean, there was a friend of ours that joked about if you were an ex-Korean founder, automatically your valuation was significantly higher than anybody else. And fair enough. I mean, I think that the DNA of Korean, ex-Korean people are kind of amazing. Um, but again, it's like, you know, we need to think about inclusion and how to actually think about like people that may not have had the networks, may not have gone to like have had privilege of where they've gone to school. Um, all of those things combined means that it's still not an equal playing field for everyone right now. So I think there's still that. I agree. And yeah, absolutely. I, I really, and I like that I do I has, and we'll talk about I do I shortly as well, but I like that you guys always have had this uh, spirit of inclusivity and gender balance and a lot of different programs for women as well. 
Um, so yeah, so I uh, just a word to the audience. Right now, it's my turn to ask the questions, but you guys will get your turn. We'll have a Q&A session right after. So whatever, uh, if you guys have any questions, just fill them in in the Q&A section and I'll address them at the end. Um, uh, Ms. Pa and Kasum both, I mean, of course, you both have, uh, I'm sure in your experiences, have a lot of startups who pitched to you guys and uh, who pitched and pitched again as well. So you must know, um, you know, what, what makes or breaks a fundraising pitch. And, you know, in, in, even in your opinions, how important is the pitch itself when uh, you're raising funds? So just anyone of you or maybe both of you can uh, answer. Sure. Um, so I think, look, uh, the challenge with the pitch is it's, uh, it, it has to be a balanced approach. On one hand, the pitch is not going to get you the money, but the pitch is going to get you your foot in the door. So what I always advise founders is that have your story right. It could be a 30 second or a one minute uh, conversation with someone. It doesn't have to be a fancy pitch deck, but you need to know what is the problem that you're solving? Uh, why should I care that you're solving this problem? And how big is it going to be? And of course, who you are is also a very important aspect of that. So I think often, you know, when we meet people at conferences or if you're in a situation where you're talking to potential investors and you only have a minute of their attention, I would say get to the point, be very clear about what it is that you're doing, uh, because that's your like 30 to 30 to 60 second opportunity to get their attention. And of course, all of the conversation is going to happen later on. But if at that point you can get them interested by, you know, what you're doing, who you are, what problem you're solving. Uh, that's getting the foot in the door. I think beyond that, you know, for a pitch deck, thankfully now we have a lot of resources that are available. Uh, the work that the accelerators and the incubators are doing is obviously there, but there's there are a lot of resources online that founders can now tap into, which they didn't have 10 years ago. So I would say do your homework. There's no re there's no excuse for a bad pitch. Do your homework, get an idea of on look at stuff online. If you're part of a program, you're probably already being helped, uh, you know, with it, like the kind of stuff that you know the Telenor Velocity folks to they will help you hone your pitch down and I think there are two aspects to it one is the deck itself where you can look at resources and really follow the pattern that you should be it should be crisp but you should also address a few of the key points that found, that investors are looking for um, I think the other aspect of it is sometimes I see and, and that's more of an insight that sometimes actually people really trying to tell a story so hard that it starts sounding fake so I would say always be yourself always be authentic because at the end of the day investors are going to pick you because of you or if you're a big story and like, you know, if you're actually making things up and like, you know, engineering backwards into how suddenly an apple fell on your head and you thought of this wonderful startup idea or you had a bad experience. Most of the time, most of investors are going to be able to see through that. So I would say be genuine, be yourself. And then on the actual deck and stuff, there, there are resources that you can actually, um, you know, access to be able to build a, a great story. Uh, and then, if, you know, again, the pitch deck is not going to get you the deal, but it's definitely getting you the foot in the door. So if your pitch deck is the only thing I'm seeing before I even meet you, then I need to be able to be excited about it by looking at the first five or six slides and then want to continue the conversation further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing really to add to that. I mean, um, Ms. Ben, I have implemented on our first call that you have with us, it's only 30 minutes and it's obviously we need much more time with you than that, but it's, it gives us an opportunity to see what you say in those 30 minutes. Right. And I think if you can't even communicate, I mean, to Ms. Bush's point, it's like normally you only have 30 to 60 seconds with someone when you meet them, but even with us on our first call with someone, if it's only 30 minutes and you still can't get your business across to us, then that's probably a red flag. Um, so, I mean, and that's a bit of a soft skill, right? That's a bit of a communication thing. So those are things that support programs can really help you with. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that if you're early stage, people just, it's very, you know, we're taking the risk and knowing that obviously you need to know your business, you need to know the strategy, you need to be thinking big. I think that's a big thing is that a lot of times I'll meet people that are maybe too niche and like, or thinking really small and um, that while that might be okay and that's great for you, if especially if you're speaking to a VC investor, um, we're thinking, we have to think big, right? Like we're building, we're, we're investing in companies that need to go to like 20, 30, 40 X, right? They need to be the next potential airlifts or bazaars or whatever is out there, right? And so you need to think big and that needs to be showcased and not, and not on BS, right? So to Ms. Buzz's point, I mean, you don't, um, we, I think at least her and I, we, we can sniff that out pretty quickly. Like if you're telling us the truth or not. And also um, don't, don't, if you don't believe in it, we're not gonna believe in it, right? So I really believe that founders need to have real conviction. I mean, to what Ms. Buzz was saying, founders really need to have real conviction around what they're building 
building. And if you don't have conviction, we can't have conviction in you. So that needs to be really communicated out to us. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And actually I'll add one thing there, uh, Sanya, I think yes. to the point that Kulsum is making, um, and this comes to probably something that we're going to talk a little bit more about later as well, but it's also relevant here is like, know who you're pitching to. So no, do your homework on the investor that you're pitching to. Like, you know, most of us have websites. Most of us have been covered in articles, at least as local investors. The global ones definitely have a portfolio that you can look at. You will, you, if you do a little bit of homework, you can figure out, do they invest in a company like yours? Would they invest at a company at the stage that your company is in? Would they invest in a company in the space that your company is in? And, and again, that's homework that you can do. So, you know, if, if I never, if I only invest in early stage companies, a consumer, I only at i 2 Ventures only invest in early stage companies and somebody comes to us saying, I'm raising a series B, then there's obviously a mismatch yeah. over there, right? Um, so that's one thing. I think the other thing is that, um, and maybe we can talk about this a little later, there's a continuum of the kinds of investment that you can raise. You could maybe at an early stage, you're not right, or the business that you're in may not be right for VC investment. Maybe it's better for a local investor to come in or a strategic investor or an angel investor. Mm-hmm. So I think that also has an impact on on understanding your investor and the right fit for you because your pitch may be great, but the fit may not be there, which is why the conversation may not proceed ahead. So I think if you can do a bit of your homework, uh, that would help as well. Yeah. And actually this leads to my next question as well. I was gonna ask you guys how important it is to choose the right VC firm or have the right fit of the firm for the startup. Um, and how do you know who, how to approach them? Like it's, it's, it's uh, for me, I know there are, I, I, I might know the answer, but I'd like for you guys to let us know from a VC perspective. How do you approach them is what the first question, the first, second question, sorry. The yeah. First question so the was second what? question is that, and the first is how important it is to choose the right firm for you. Oh, how yeah. Do you know 110%. I mean, think that, you know, you really need to do your homework. And actually one thing that Ms. Ben, I always say to uh, potential people that we're speaking to, especially if it's a competitive deal is go speak to our portfolio companies, right? Don't talk to us. Cause if you ask us what we're going to do for you, of course, everyone is going to sell you on how everyone is founder friendly. Everyone's going to be giving you like, you know, all these like things on top of giving you money. Um, I think that we, you know, obviously we're biased, but obviously this is what our founders tell us that we punch way above our weight in terms of how much support we give um, our portfolio companies. So we always tell our founders, go speak to, um, go, we speak to our potential founders to go speak to our current founders because, and then don't just speak to our current founders. If you're speaking to a number of different VC funds, speak to all of those companies, right? Of who they've invested in. What do they say about them? We've definitely seen deals that, you know, they, that, that founder has done the homework and that's actually how they picked the VC funds that they were working with. Um, asking yourself like strategically, what do I need? Right? Like, and if there's a lot of people potentially approaching us and you have to weed them out, what do I actually say? Who do I say yes to is based off of like, does this person bring network? Right. If you're speaking to international funds, like really what you need to be looking at is they, do they bring, like, if they've invested in comparable companies in other markets, do I get access to that? Right. Can I get access to that support? Um, and to like those, those people, the second thing is, do they bring additional money like in the future rounds? Right. That's a big thing, especially for Pakistan is like looking for people like that locally. It's also saying like, okay, does this person bring strategic network here? Like, I mean, what we always say, like, um, you know, we're closing our third fintech deal. Ms. Buzz's background is like, she worked at a global fintech company before this, right? And I mean, as and we have like that expertise there as a, re, as a result, she's kind of our resident skeptic in a good way, right? Because she knows what works and what doesn't work in the market. So what is the market knowledge? How do they know how to navigate things? Like, what are the ways to get things done? That's the first question. I'll let Ms. Buzz take the second one because I just talked a lot, so. Yeah, I think also in terms of, you know, uh, figuring out who and how much, I think, again, this question comes at like, depends on what time you're, what time stage of the company, you know, you're raising at, and again, what the match looks like. What we're starting to see right now is that in certain sectors, there's a lot of attention. And so valuations are, you know, going, getting higher. We're also seeing people come from outside the country that have higher appetite in terms of valuations, et cetera. So I think, again, looking at what's going on, uh, you know, will uh, will get you a little, will get you pretty far in terms of of, uh, you know, accessing investors, look at the deals that they've already done, look at the deals that they've done in other markets. But I think it also, if you're thinking about outreach, most of us have emails on our uh, websites or have forms that you can fill out. Um, you know, for example, with us, we have a place where you can send a pitch deck. So you can actually reach out to people and, and engage with them without necessarily having to be in their network. And then of course, if you're part of a program, 
an accelerator program, an incubator program, then there are demo days and you have office hours and you're able to uh, get in front of people. So I think one is to do your homework on like figuring out what that landscape looks like. I think the other one to Kusum's point is like, you know, figure out who are the people within that landscape that not only fit where you are at, but also the, the kinds of relationships that you would want and the kinds of investors, you know, that you would want. And then of course, think forward in terms of what comes next um, in that stage. Mm, and Thank the one you, thing, Ms. Perkins. Sorry. Yeah, I, was just gonna, I was just going to add to that. There's also the power of, you know, don't underestimate cold, cold emails, right? Um, to the point of like, yes, reach out on the website, but like I've gotten LinkedIn messages uh, from people that have been really interesting. And we've, we've, been, we've talked to people based off of that, like uh, or Twitter DMs, Twitter DMs. <laughs> Um, I think we're all making sure that we're just trying to check everything as much as possible in terms of what our intake looks like. And I think that, um, you know, what's really a really interesting thing is that, and this is so fun for me, I think Ms. But doesn't like it as much, but I love the back end of like talking to everybody on WhatsApp. Investors all speak to each other all the time. So if your deck is sent to someone, there's a likelihood they're going to share it with someone else to get someone's feedback. So there's power of network as well of like investors all speaking to one another, especially like angel syndicates, like things like that. So syndicates can be super helpful because they oftentimes have like, you know, strong networks themselves. So don't underestimate that as well. If you get into a really good syndicate, they are connected to other funds. So um, yeah. So I think so I'm really glad you mentioned it because it. just uh, uh, while Ms. Ba was talking, I was just thinking about the same thing that there are startups out there who do cold emails, who do cold reach outs on LinkedIn. And I just wanted to know your perspective on that uh, and see if you guys get that same sort of like. I think, Sanya, uh, like to what Kusum was saying earlier. Oh, inclusive. And we also yes. recognize that a lot of times people that are from smaller cities in Pakistan or maybe have not gone to the top business school or maybe have not worked at Unilever or Shell or PSO before don't have sometimes don't have, don't have those networks. And so at least from our, I can talk about us and say that we, we do want to give people an opportunity to reach out to us if they're not in our network, because I think that's how you kind of level the playing field. I think when it comes to female founders, Kusum and I are activists about it because if you just look at the funnel, um, you know, and then just the sheer numbers, uh, the number of women in the space is few to begin with, right? And then as the number, like, you know, last year we spoke to over 150 companies and we invested in three. So that gives you an, um, an idea of the mag order of magnitude. Now, if we were to not be activists about looking for diverse founders, especially women in this example, then we're not going to get them just because we sit back and say, Achha, you know, let's see what, what comes to me out of the 150, which one is attractive. So we're actually go actively going out and looking for women. And I think this cold email question also sometimes does help level the playing field. So it's something that we're trying to be more conscious about that. Yes, a warm intro is great, but we also recognize that sometimes there's privilege with the warm intro. Um, and you need to know someone who knows someone and like, you know, we're trying to consciously at least give people a chance. Uh, so to sort of, you know, reach out to us, even if they're not in our network. Yeah. And that being said, like, if we don't respond, I mean, the thing is like, as I say that, like we get inundated with inundated. Yeah. yeah. Like it's just yeah, a lot. I, I, and so well, if, if we don't get back to you, I was listening to, was there Yunus did a really good um, episode this weekend with Ariba Shahid for Pakistanomy. And they were talking about cold emails, right? And like the power of cold intros. Don't be afraid if we don't get back to you to follow up and to hound us, right? Like I actually kind of appreciate that with people that, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely like that in terms of just like following up with people. So don't be afraid to do that as well, just because just be mindful of the fact that if we're not getting back to you, it's not a sign that we don't necessarily like you it's yeah. just that we just have so much on our plate that or we may have missed it we may have forgotten to get back to you so don't be afraid to follow up absolutely thank you, thank you. and i i think let's um i wanted to just move the sort of conversation a bit to eye to eye i just want to uh, no, so I know I've been following Ida for quite some time. I know that you guys work with high risk, high reward growth markets, and you've been working in different markets um, um, across the world, uh, different startup communities, and uh, you then help startups and then accelerate them. Um, in your opinion, um, what were some of the challenges, Salsum and Nispa, that you faced while raising funds for early stage enterprises in such markets uh, globally? And then there's a follow-up question to this as well, but like, what has been your experience so far? Sure. So I just want to make the distinction first that 
what MISPA and I are running is our fund, which is totally a separate entity to what Invest to Innovate, the company that I founded 10 years ago is. So everything that we've done in terms of support work, the research team, all of that sits under that umbrella. And then the fund yeah. in terms of us investing, that's Miss Ben I co-founding and starting that in 2019. So the question is, is more really regarding Invest to Innovate and, and the things that we saw in terms of the lessons that we learned and in terms of companies raising money, correct? Yeah. Yes. And markets outside Pakistan as well. Mm, yeah. So real quick on the markets outside of Pakistan. So when I started Invest to Innovate 10 years ago, I really thought ultimately we were going to be working in many countries really quickly. Um, we started really with the idea that, you know, the belief that the next great innovators are coming out of markets like Pakistan, but that maybe we'd be working in like you know, Nigeria, all these places right off the bat. And then when we started in Pakistan, it was just so early, the ecosystem back then, there was just so much to do that there was real, there was real need to actually provide depth and value in, in the startup ecosystem in Pakistan before we decided to go outwards. And so from my side, like, I think what was really interesting was that after a certain point of having done that work, I think it had been about five years for the very first time, someone in Bangladesh, as an example, reached out to me um, and was like, hey, we're starting to do what you're doing. We're just five years later. Um, can you share your insights in terms of that? And I ended up, we ended up helping build out the first accelerator program, the Grameen Phone Accelerator, actually, uh, which is related to Telenor, <laughs> early days of that um, in Bangladesh, right? Because there was a lot of transferable knowledge of what um, we were doing. And then, you know, I was in Singapore and ended up working then as a result with programs in Cambodia, Vietnam. Bangladesh, Nepal. And what was really interesting was that, you know, the lessons of working in a startup ecosystem like Pakistan is very similar to what's happening, even in a place like Fiji, right? And I think our markets are so high friction that you think that we're the only ones facing this. And yet there's so many similarities, especially even with the DNA of founders, like um, people that have to work, like this idea of like, you know, like people that are really taking things up on their own. And so I think once we started to realize that we had enough under our belt to make us relative experts at it, then we started to go outwards. And so now even our team just recently worked with programs in Iraq and Lebanon, hopefully when we're growing that throughout the Middle East now. Very um, nice. so yeah, so all of it's starting to just kind of, you know, snowball a little bit, but it took us really building depth in Pakistan and really knowing what we were doing. And I think one thing that we've done really well, I hope, is that every time we've built a program, it's never been the program, has never stayed stagnant. We've always taken feedback from founders every cycle, every weekend of the program, we built off of that. And then our program today looks completely different from what our program looked, you know, 10 years ago now. So, um, and I think having that type of growth mindset for us, we were always looking at global standards of what it meant to incubate and accelerate companies, not local. So for us, it was always about like, okay, how do we up our game? How do we become the best pro like program? I mean, not that we're, we are, but I'm just saying like, that was always our intention is how do we become the best program in the world? Not just in our country, right? And so that was always, you know, our standard of what we looked at. And that's how I think we continue to like up our game every time, which I hope, you know, we continue to do now. So um, I no longer run the day-to-day -day. Mavish. Our CEO is amazing as you know, Sonia. So, um, and she's, she is definitely upping our game right now, which is, which is really exciting to see. But then, uh, so why, why do you think, um, why do you think it was essential for you guys to shift, uh, or not shift, but like basically in addition to being an accelerator uh, with I2I to, I to start I2I to I Ventures and took the vision forward as a venture capital fund? I yeah. Wanna... Sure. I mean, I think really it was Kulsum's vision, but I can speak to it as well. Um, we, we've come to the point now where we can finish each other's sentences and we <laughs> spend more time with each other than we do our husbands. So um and also, also change, changing it up because we're always talking about ourselves. So maybe I'll talk about Kulsum now. So I think I think the vision, Sanya, was that as as we built the accelerator and started doing the insights, started realizing what was happening, started seeing patterns in the space and also recognized the need for good capital to come to founders, right? We saw the opportunity for good investors to come. At the same time, there were things happening which have now resulted in what we've seen in the last year and a half of like really accelerated growth. So we saw all of those signs coming five years 
ago, right? So at least four years ago, three years ago. So I think one, it was this, uh, this opportunity for us to come in as good investors, as being founder friendly, as having that background firmly rooted in working with startups and coming from that mindset first and yet recognizing there is a commercial opportunity here where you know this is the things are getting better in the startup space and that there is going to be an opportunity to you know collectively make lots of money as well um i think for us we also recognize that being investors with this kind of background makes us stand out amongst everybody else, to be honest, in the space, because nobody else has this kind of background that we have of working in the space. And, and I've been on Kulsum's board of advisors for i 2 i from the day she started. So I've kind of seen the journey as well. You know, I've done impact investing myself and also worked on the corporate side and worked in the fintech. So Kulsum and I both bring the operator mindset because we've you know been in early stage in companies or run our own companies and also having worked with founders for so long um, have started seeing patterns in terms of what good founders actually uh, end up being like and what are the traits that they show and what are the approaches that they have. And so I think that uniquely positions us to not only leverage our experience, but also with the sister entity uh, with i 2 i the accelerator program that they run, they have access to founders at very early stages, which we can actually, you know, get great pipeline from. And the research team is actually supplementing our work uh, by, by sort of engaging with our portfolio companies on the fund side going forward once we make the investment. So I think we, are, we recognize that we are uniquely positioned to be investors um, and not be VC as usual. Also, I think by being women, we're kind of already breaking some of those boundaries and, and we hope that more women will come into the space, but also recognizing that we had to bring, bring a different perspective and we felt like that market needed that perspective. So we saw kind of like that fit, although that doesn't mean we don't have imposter syndrome from time to time and wonder <laughs> that, you know, are we actually doing this? Uh, but, but yeah, I think there's a lot of conviction in what we've learned and seen and done in the last decade that has led us to the point that we are today. Absolutely, and now in all of the years of experience, I feel this is the right. This was the right step forward uh, for I do I and I do I Ventures as well. Um, just to follow up question: Would you? Um, is there a way for you to now be able to profile a certain kind of startup or an entrepreneur with an entrepreneurial mindset? Is that something that you guys like? Are there commonalities or common traits that you see in certain founders? Just to Random yeah, I mean, there's definitely traits that we like. So I think there's, I mean, everyone is different, right? I mean, every, that's we'll true. meet an investor that's like, I really like this guy. He was super aggressive. And what we, what he saw as aggressive, we saw as like aggressive. Or was that like, what we didn't see it that way, right? So I think the, yeah. very, the first thing that I would say is that every investor has a different perspective on what's entrepreneurial, what makes a good, um, makes a good founder. I think Ms. Ben and I have been talking about this a lot. I think there's a lot of mirroring that happens of like we've the founders that if you meet all of the founders in our portfolio, they actually exhibit extremely similar traits to each other. Um, they all obviously have different skill sets and whatever, but there is a sense of what we really love is there's, they all have a sense of curiosity about them, which to me, curiosity and, and to Ms. as well, curiosity is like a major characteristic of a good founder of like someone that's constantly asking questions, knowing what they don't know, I think is really, really important. I think there's also a sense of, and, and not in a soft way, right? Like you can be aggressive and still have a sense of humility of like what you don't know, what are the things that you need to learn, like how you take constructive criticism. Um, and it's, it's amazing. Cause I think that really, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that seems so intangible, but like, um, I think Ms. and I've been doing this together for so long that we typically have the same reaction. The minute we meet a founder, um, sometimes like in our decision-making process, the two of us, it takes us, we come at things from different lenses, but I think when it comes to founders, we have a similar sense of why we like the founders. And I think we typically can see that right off the bat, even in the first conversation. Um, I don't know, Ms. Beth, if you want to add to that or not. Yeah, I think just in terms of specific traits, again, like like you know, to everything that Kulsum said, but just an add-on is I think what we also see is like that's that balance between vision and, and working hard. So you can't just be like a boss man or a boss lady and just have this vision and then expect somebody else to come and magically have the elves that are going to come and make it happen, right? You've got to be able to roll up your sleeves. A lot of the founders that we've worked with have done the job themselves initially. Uh, they've gone out and actually performed the service so that they can learn and, you know, they're talking constantly to their customers. So it's about rolling up your sleeves and getting the work done, not being afraid, but also having enough vision to know how you want to build that company. And of course, as early stage investors, we are there as partners. We're not there to tell you what to do. And we're also not there to be like, uh, we'll just sit back and let you do whatever you're doing. So it's kind of this balance of like, 
who are the kinds of founders that are going to take good feedback, but are also know themselves enough, have enough of a vision and conviction in what they're building to take it to a certain extent. Yeah. And, and, and then we come on focus. as add-on. And yeah. not lose focus. I think focus and, and tenacity, yeah. uh, you know, we often use the word gritty, which can, can sometimes be, you know, used in a different way as well. But if you think about it in a positive way, it's like, digging your heels in and please Pakistan is a very high friction market we all know that so if any market is going to test your resilience and your patience and your your the fact that you you know that you require focus it's Pakistan so mm. you've got to dig your heels in and, and just you know be can be have a conviction about what you're doing but also be open to getting feedback as you grow and criticism yeah absolutely I um so I honestly I love the duo that you guys have I love the partnership and you know the friendship that the two of you have and I want to take my next question forward to um how important it is to choosing the right co-founder um and how that affects the success of your company and obviously with that in mind I want to also want to ask you what vision or goals did you both share uh for the future of IDI IDI Ventures Yeah Miss why don't you go Yeah first? Yeah, I think in terms of uh, partners, Sanya, like this is, I mean, this is the same thing I say to founders that are looking for investors. It's like you're getting into a long-term relationship, right? So think of it as any other personal relationship where you would really want to have this person not necessarily mirror exactly who you are, but compliment you. And I think, um, you know, it's, I, I, there are days when I'm so grateful. I mean, I'm grateful for Kulsum every day, but there are days when I'm like, I can't do this. And she's the one that's like, come on, we got this. And then there are days that she's feeling down and I'm able to bring it up. So the power of having a strong co-founder or someone that compliments you, I just, I feel like it's, it's cannot be underscored enough because uh, nobody else will ever understand what you're going through than your co-founder nobody else will ever get it as much as your co-founder will your spouse won't your siblings won't your partners uh, in you know and on your business or whatever may not but your co-founder will because they're facing the same kind of um, issues or or even you know um, sort of obstacles as you build so i think it's really important to start on a on mutual respect so kulsum and i may have differences in opinion about certain things or we always talk them through with a with a sense of mutual respect and admiration honestly like i don't think there's anybody else that i would rather do this with but i'm also acknowledging that i i'm very lucky in that i i have a co-founder who i get along so well with so i think it's very easy to say don't do a solo business have a co-founder but we also recognize that it's very hard to find that so i don't know kaka if you have like more specific sort of insights but for me i think you start with mutual respect you have to have shared values and then you can defer on the specifics that's 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 the small stuff um mm-hmm. as long as you're able to talk through it uh, in a mutually respected way and also have a the same long term vision i think that's also important to take you through uh in in a co-founder totally um i would also just i mean it is like a marriage right so the same things you should look for in a a spouse uh you should probably look for in a co-founder because you're probably spending more time speaking and as Ms. Ben mentioned we do spend more time speaking to each other than our actual spouses so i think at the end of the day like it's totally fine to have a difference in opinion i think we have the same shared vision of where we're going but i think one thing that i would add is like open communication plays a very very important role so i think every time Ms. Ben and i've disagreed we've actually just had really open discussions about why we've disagreed and i think that also models behavior for your team right we're not afraid to to disagree in front of our team. Um and it's not in a, a antagonistic way, it's almost like it's a debate, it's a discourse. Everyone's allowed to be part of it. Um that's how we operate as leaders as well and I think people really respect that. One of our fellows was actually just mentioning that to us that it comes across that like we just we respect each other and so debating something isn't coming from a place of like you're wrong it's more just like this is my perspective this is your perspective we come into the middle that's good and then that models really good culture i think for the rest of your organization as well of like people being able to voice things if they don't agree right um mm-hmm. if the top two people are doing that in in ways that isn't isn't disrespectful so no thank you i I think I uh so we have a lot of questions coming in and although I have uh I I'd like to keep this conversation going I'd really like to uh just open the floor and ask a couple of questions here um so Umar Said is asking we are seeing a lot of focus on fintech and sort of sort of bazaars how how do you see a marketing platform in the presence of Facebook and Google offering precision marketing hmm 
Um, that's interesting. So look, there are there are a few opportunities coming up in the marketing space as well. Um, you know, also seeing more broadly people looking at beyond Facebook. I mean, I know that's not directly Omar's question, but beyond Facebook, we just heard today Wally raised two point five two point seven million dollars, and they're an influencer platform. So we're starting to see people in the creative space also thinking about startups. I think with precision marketing, um, the challenge would be like first of all, what is the expected life cycle of this company, right? As things change in in the in the digital marketing space uh, the question would be how far is this going to continue to add value so i think the challenge with vc funding uh, now this doesn't mean that your business model cannot raise money you can probably raise money through a strategic investor like actually wali has done or through others but for a vc to come in they need to see that this market opportunity is big enough for them to get like 10 times the investment or the company to go 10 times so um, not knowing the specifics of precision marketing itself and what the numbers are i would say i think what's important for you to do is to have a look at what that size of the market is and how long it's going to continue because what a vc is going to want to do is come in and stay with you for 5 to 7 to 10 years in terms of the growth of the company and if this idea is going to expect it to be obsolete obsolete in like 3 years then i want to make sure that i'm making 10 times my money in 3 years as opposed to a 5 year or 7 year horizon so i think to you know to the question again in terms of like this area specifically i think it all depends on uh you know what what uh that space is like in terms of the size and the opportunity uh you know in there yeah uh, and again i mean looking yeah. at the question again like i i'm not really sure whether they mean that they because facebook and google already have precision marketing so they're yeah. wanting to offer a marketing platform which may be competing so i think same same Probably point like if you're, yeah right so if you're offering something yeah. that's competing you uh, one you got to be able to show that it really brings value to the, your customers uh and then to to an outside investor i think the question would be uh how big can you actually grow given the value mm-hmm. that you're bringing to your customers and then also just to that person's point you know is the loc- is is what you're doing localized and is being localized important enough that that's why your solution exists right because obviously we demand precision marketing there's a lot of like global global solutions obviously there is google and like all of that so why are you doing something that is so urgent that people need to invest in you so i think that's the question that you need to really address and to just to take two questions at once there was a question in the chat about how big is big um, about yeah. market size and i mean don't i mean obviously your market size shouldn't be tiny but don't worry about it being in like x billion dollars it's more about really like it's number one to miss best point is like how if an investor is coming in at a certain valuation can they 10x that right i mean we look at every deal from and work backwards from like is this if this gets to 10x what does that mean how do we work backwards from that and that's a minimum for a vc fund right um but then also like um you know it's enough it's you can say your market size is like x billion dollars but then if you don't actually have a strategy on how you're actually going to get there how you're going to capture a certain percentage of that like what's your addressable market what's your obtainable market like if you don't have a sense of that then it doesn't really matter how big your market size is yeah and to that point sometimes we see companies founders come and say oh the market size is 10 billion and i'm going to take 10% of that therefore my valuation is. you know value, yeah and then therefore my valuation is whatever but i think again if you're just putting a number out of a hat and saying it's 10% you know investors are going to want to see how you get there so the business model has to be built in a way that's helping you access that target market so it's a mix of of that market opportunity but also how much of it is addressable how much of it is going to be sustain serviceable from your perspective yeah um it's all it's always a mix of like art and science to be honest i mean yeah. we can talk about these numbers and and the problem with box sun is that the data we don't have a ton of data right so a lot of times you're using the data that we find out there but then you're kind of working backwards and being like hey well how much do i want to give away at a certain round or whatever and so mm-hmm. it's all just kind of a mix of different things and knowing that you you know it's also going to be a negotiation with an investor so um yeah yeah i'm going to jump in uh with the question that kazi asked um around r&d and raising yeah. money for r&d since we're talking about raising funds and i think r&d for ev charging i think the challenge uh kazi suhail is that um r&d is really hard to raise venture money for uh, you already mentioned you have money from the nordic council and some other government things i would say in in situations like that you're better off getting either grants or 
uh, even you know certain convertible forms on funding where somebody is going to come in and give you money because they're taking a bet on whether that R and D will even be successful. So to be honest, this is a very hard sector, not just in EV charging, but even in like let's say biotech or 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 science based companies. It's very hard for a startup to get get in there, which is why we don't see that many startups in these spaces because R and D requires a lot of money and R and D funders are very few and far between. So I would say look at government programs, EV especially. The government is really focusing on EV right now. Now, maybe there's an opportunity for you to access certain funds from there. It could either be financing from a bank or other entity at very uh, affordable or attractive rates, or it could be just simply grant funding. Uh, unfortunately, there are not a lot of uh, VC investors that will fund R&D, but you should look outside Pakistan because globally, there might be some that do. So I think, again, do your homework, uh, look at stuff online and figure out globally who are people that are either climate change, climate focused, there are green funds that are out there that would love EV uh, kinds of companies um, and that would potentially you know, be happy to fund R&D because they see you know, where this is going forward. And again, uh, I'm not sure what the terms would be in terms of equity or whatever. Maybe that you can get equity financing, but I would think it would be from a specialized funder and very likely outside Pakistan that is focused on green uh, energy, climate change, um, and maybe even coming in as early as at R&D stage. No, wonderful. Hi. So there's another question. I think I'm just going to, Bilal Sheikh is asking, um, I think it's around equity. When my venture capitalist funds in a startup, uh, how then how does the founding team decide how much equity should be given, for example, in Series A and other series? Yeah. I think rule of thumb is don't give away more than 10 to 20 in your, yeah, yeah 20 is, should be the max in your first round, uh, you know, which is at, in your seed, at your seed stage. Um, because you recognize that you will only continue to have to go lower and lower in terms of the equity that you're giving away. So, and that's why to Kusum's point earlier about like bad funders that we saw in the market 10 years ago, eight years ago, taking a 40% of a company's equity in the early round means that the founder only has 60% left. And the next round of funding, everybody loses. So the 60% wala comes down to 50, the 40% wala comes down to 30. But like as the founder loses less, more and more equity, they get less and less incentivized to continue to really push on the business. So as a founder, I think the challenge is, is that troika of like how much money you want to raise, what valuation can you raise at, and how much you're, what amount you're comfortable giving away. Uh, so yeah, rule of thumb, I, I think, you know, under 20% in your first round is really what you should be looking at. I think um, series A and beyond, you can start diluting a little bit. Also sometimes depends on how much you're raising and, and what the valuation also is. Um, so it's, 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 not an, it's not an exact number or an exact science, unfortunately. Yeah, not an exact, yeah, not an exact science. Pay attention to dilution as Ms. Ba was mentioning, because I think a lot of people just think about their first round and it doesn't seem bad to say that I still have 60% of my company, but if you, so there's some great tools online, like dilution calculators, things like that. You can create, like, you know, look at your future rounds and start to create, like use the dilution calculator, see, see if I give up this much now, what does that mean in future rounds? If I'm planning to raise like X, Y, and Z and, um, you know, series A and B. So use those tools they are all free and they're all online. And that will really help you understand, like, you know, the longevity of what you're doing, because it's not just this one round, especially if you're in a venture capital cycle, it's going to be multiple rounds. So yeah. pay attention to that. But I can tell you as an investor, if we look at it, if we look at someone that comes to us, it has already raised money from someone and given away 40% of the company, that's going to be a red flag for us as later stage <laughs> investors coming in because we're like, yeah. this person's already given 40% away. Yeah. You know, by the time they raise two more rounds of funding, they'll be diluted to the point where they'll definitely have less than majority of the company. And then, you know, are they going to continue to stay incentivized or not is the question. Yeah. Uh, Mehdi Zaidi has a really nice uh, question. So he's saying impressive discussion. And as an emerging undergraduate, I am unable to see the growth of social entrepreneurs working on the SDGs of UN, especially in Pakistan. What would you probably, what would probably be the future of social entrepreneurs in Pakistan? It depends yeah. on how you define social entrepreneurs, right? So I mean, like, 
we can, we can, we can say that we're as a fund, we are a commercial fund, but when we look at SDGs, like we're looking at job growth, right. As like what we're looking to in terms of job creation and economic prosperity, right. Is the SDG that maybe we're focused on. So I think and that women term, inclusion and women inclusion and like innovation and infrastructure, I mean, SDGs can basically mean a whole gambit of things. And so I think there's, there are, so there, there's social entrepreneurs of people that really are taking kind of that hybrid approach of like, um, you know, maybe taking more of like a, you know, less market returns, but building for good. Right. Um, in that case, there are, you know, grants that are out there for you, philanthropic foundations, impact investors that are specifically geared towards impact and they're willing to take less than market returns. So obviously, um, you know, Acumen and Pause, but they're coming back into the market. Insider, there's a few impact funds that are out there uh, regionally and globally, ADB Ventures. So I would be looking at that. Um, but I mean, I would argue that in our portfolio, they're all high growth commercial companies. They all are addressing an SDG in some way, right? So it's, again, your definition of, you know, like if we're looking at UBI, which is, you know, our fintech company that's an earned wage access platform, financial wellness platform, um, they, it's, they're, it's a very clear sense of what they're doing that has deep impact, but it's a very commercial company that we've seen in other markets raise a lot of money. Right. So yeah. it again, depends on your definition of what social entrepreneur means, but then that opens up different options for you from a funding perspective, um, and yeah. how you frame yourself. Last question, because I know we're a little, we're two minutes over time. Uh, Kazi is asking was, uh, so as part of the due diligence process during the investment, what are the things you really see in detail? What document systems, et cetera, should be in place and be in order? Yeah, and I, I'm looking at his third question, which is about KPIs or metrics at each stage. So I'll answer that oh, as I well. Did. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think, um, look, the due diligence process, every fund has their own, every investor has their own specific process. Uh, some do certain things earlier than, uh, than others. Uh, but broadly speaking, again, Google the stuff. It's, there's a lot that's already out there at early stage of the company. You'll get a sense of what people are looking for. For us, we like to see a business plan. We like to see some traction in the company. Uh, we also like to see where the company is going and the founder's vision in terms of the numbers. Obviously at a very early stage, the numbers are there to guide us in terms of how the founder is thinking. I don't think we're gonna get stuck on like, oh, you sales are gonna be 20,000 next year or are they gonna be 21,000 because it's anybody's guess. So I think for us looking at the numbers, so have, have your set of numbers, have a financial model that is built off of your business model and your business plan. So I think a business plan is very important. You need to have a sense of what um, your market is like, what is your target market, who is your target market, and what is the bigger uh, oppor the opportunity that you're going after, how big is that? So I think investors will want you to be able to tell them, this is the size of the opportunity, this is the part of it that I'm capturing, and this is how I'm going to get there. Uh, so those are the things. I think team is important, so you should have an idea, if you don't already have a team, who are the people that you would want to hire? How do you see that growing? Um, and I think the big picture, big vision should be there as well. So as part of your business plan, talk about what you're doing now and what you're going to be doing, but also talk about where you want to get to uh, so that the investor can see what your, you know, your, your, your blue sky thinking, for example. Um, and then most people will ask you for specific things. So there are a couple of documents that, you know, they will ask for in terms of, um, I already mentioned business plan, financial model, uh, you know, team uh, and where you expect to send, spend the money that you're actually raising uh, and, you know, how you plan to expand, et cetera. So I think that's some of the, so those are some of the things. And just last thing is on KPI and metric, there's, there's no hard number because each sector is different and each stage is different. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you where I can say you should be showing X in your, you know, customer acquisition cost, for example, or your, or your you know, lifetime value of your customer, because it would be different depending on the stage that you're in and the industry that you're in as well. Having said that, there are benchmarks that you can look at globally. There's not a lot of data in Pakistan, but you can sort of extrapolate that a little bit. Look at India, look at Indonesia, apply a bit of a discount factor because we are not as big or as advanced as those markets. So if you see a startup doing something in a similar space in Indonesia and you want to mirror that or you're doing something similar, use that as, as a benchmark and then apply a bit of a discount rate to search how, you know, in Pakistan, there would be 30% less of that or 40% less potentially. Yeah. Um, the only thing that I would add about like the due diligence process, I mean, some investors are more stringent than others. I would say that we're actually quite stringent. We like to look at a lot of things. 
Um, some people, you know, I've seen international funds turn around a term sheet in 48 hours, right? So I guess, you know, they obviously look at things, but it's not as in depth. Um, my one piece of advice is create a data room, but preempt it, right? Create a data room right off the bat. So rather than wait for investors to tell you what they want, create a data room that has like your marketing strategy, your sales strategy, who the team members are, um, you know, what your financials look like, your unit economics, like have all of it to go if you want the process to move relatively fast. And then you can just add to it based on what people are looking for. But I find it really impressive when people already have their data room ready. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a, we have a, we had a company that we were speaking to that, um, had like an FAQ of like all these investors were asking the same question. So they just created an, a frequently asked questions document. And I just found that to be so impressive. I was like, that's so great that you're doing that because you're helping us all in the process, understand the sector better and your approach. Right. So, um, yeah, the more you preempt that, we find that quite impressive to be honest when people do that. Thank you. And any last piece of advice for entrepreneurs just starting out, looking out and anything that you guys want to add? Although I know we've, we've pretty much covered a lot of areas, but. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I would just say, it's hard. I mean, this is such a hard journey. So as much as like we talk about all these, like funding is your metric of success, you don't have to raise funding to be successful, right? I mean, and you and the, actually it's even better. The longer you wait, the more power you have at the negotiating table. If you've never had to give up equity, that's even better, right? Um, so not everyone, don't look at like what's out there um, externally as like that is your metric of success, right? I was seeing this tweet that was going around and we're like, these are the companies in Fox on that have, have raised a million and above. And I'm like, why is that our metric all of a sudden that that's what success is, is that a million and above means you're successful. So don't let other people people define that for you, you need to say for yourself, like, what is it that's really important for my journey, my success? Do I want to be a venture back firm that comes with its own set of evils, to be honest, and not in a bad way, but there's expectations that come with like, um, when you raise venture financing, right. In terms of expectations on growth and what you're going to do for future rounds. So, um, you know, everyone's journey is going to be different and like, you need to decide what's best for you in that. And it's going to be hard. And I think you need to choose investors that are going to be along for the ride and be your best cheerleaders, um, and not block you in that, in that journey as well. Yeah. I love the best cheerleaders. I that's that's, that's an amazing thing to say. <laughs> yeah. And also oh, I- just the only thing I would say also, Sanya, is that there look around. I mean, there's so much that's broken in Pakistan, unfortunately, but those are all opportunities. There's a lot of opportunity in Pakistan. There's a very, there's an enabling environment right now. I would just say, go for it. Your first startup may not be successful. Maybe your second one will be inshallah or your third one. Uh, and how much you learn from, you know, from sort of doing that once or twice is going to be, is going to be huge. Yeah. The other thing I would say is that, Everyone doesn't have to be a startup founder. You can join a startup that's in a space that you feel excited about and become an early part of the team, uh, an early member of the team. You may have access to you know, uh, equity in any case because a lot of founders are now attracting good people and early parts of their teams and giving them equity. So if you're passionate about being in a startup, one, you know, there's a lot of problems that you can solve. Solve a big problem rather than look at something that's very niche or very nice to have. If you're solving a big problem, people will come. And then you, all you have to figure out is how you actually deliver what, what's missing uh, to them. And I think the second thing is like, uh, you know, don't, don't be afraid to learn from others. Like, you know, join this fast growing startup and learn from them. And like, we have examples of people who were in Kareem who for the first few years really got a, firsthand um, sort of feel of what it's like to be in a fast growing startup. And now they're building startups on their own and they have so much that they're bringing to the table in terms of that experience. So, you know, again, if you have a vision, go for it, but also recognize that you could also join another team and and build towards something uh, or just do it to get experience on your own before you go on to the next thing. But I think, you know, to Kulsum's point, there's just... Is everyone's idea of success should be different. Don't define yourself by others, uh, but also recognize that there, there's so much opportunity right now. I, I think we're in a really exciting space uh, in Pakistan today. Yeah, it's a fun it's a fun time to be a founder right now. So yeah, absolutely. Now this was a pleasure. I feel like I could just I could keep on this conversation with you guys, and we have so much to cover and so much to talk about. But we are over time, so I'd like to uh, just close this session. Kalsum, Mizba, it was a pleasure having you on this platform. Um, and I'm sure definitely in the coming months, maybe next year, we'd love to have you back and just, you know, sort of like uh, refresh all of the, these uh, conversations and see where are we now. 
Um, but yeah, so there are some people in the chat who wanted to contact you guys. So I, I just replied on your behalf that it's best to reach out to you over LinkedIn um, so that sure. uh, you know, if they want to share anything, they could definitely do that. Uh, but yeah, see you guys soon, very, very soon uh, yeah. on other platforms. And thank you so much for this lovely evening. Thank you for your time. Thank you so Thanks much. for the Such opportunity. an amazing job moderating. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> thank Talk you. Soon. Thanks, everyone, for Bye. listening. Bye, Bye. Office.